seven o'clock here, local time sharp. So let's uh, start on time. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Rupert Frank. Uh, maybe before I just say a few words about him, let me uh, remind you concerning asking questions. So we have a question and answer session basically after the lecture, but if there are any urgent questions during the lecture, uh, please either raise your hand or, or write it down in the Q and A and uh, we can already ask it during the lecture. All right, so uh, I will not take much of Rupert's time, uh, just very quick uh, bio sketch. So Rupert obtained his uh, PhD from uh, KTH, KTH in Stockholm in, in 2007. And after some uh, postdoctoral stays and, uh, as, an, and as an assistant professor in Princeton, he uh, actually became professor at Caltech in 2013. And since uh, 2016, he's also professor at LMU Munich. Uh, Rupert is well known for his uh, numerous important contributions to both analysis and mathematical physics. And uh, today he will uh, report on his uh, recent results on uh, Lee-Tiering inequalities. So please, Rupert. Well, thank you, Robert. Thanks for this kind introduction. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak here. And thanks to all of you for sticking around. I know it's late there. I'll try to be not too technical. I tried to give you an overview of what the tiering inequalities are. I will not assume that you have seen those before. And then I want to go after having described them and their the motivation why one looks at such inequalities. I want to explain you some recent results that we have obtained and then also uh, mention some open problems. So let me start right in the middle. Let me tell you what these Lipperian inequalities are. Okay, so you're given a bunch of functions psi n and on Rd, and you assume that these functions are orthonormal. And I've recalled the definition of that notion down there. They're orthonormal in L2. And you also assume you have um, a control of the L2 of the gradient. Okay. And the quantity, what you want to control is the, their square sum. So you take these functions, square them, and then you sum over all the functions. And then what you do is you raise this thing to a power greater than one and you integrate. Don't worry too much about the, the power that, that you have to put there. There's, if it works, there's a unique one, um, as you can see by scaling reasons. And anyway, the theorem of Lipiering says that you have the corresponding inequality. So this square sum raised to a power greater than one is controlled by the sum of the gradients. And the important thing here is that the constant that appears in the inequality only depends on the dimension and does not depend on the number of functions, this capital N, the number of functions that are involved in this inequality. And that's really an important thing. And this really fundamentally uses the orthonormality of the functions because consider the, the extreme opposite case where all the functions psi n are the same, say normalized in, in L2. What you have there is the left side, then you have a sum over n terms. So the left side grows like n, whereas the right side grows like n to a power greater than one. So such an inequality cannot be true or put different. If you insist on writing down such an inequality, you have to choose a constant k here, which does depend on n and which goes to zero as n goes to infinity. This inequality um, was proved by Lieb and Turing in their quest to give a, a short and uh, elegant proof of stability of matter. And so the, this is a problem in quantum mechanics. And so the quantities that you see in the inequality do have some um, interpretation in quantum mechanics. Um, what you see here, you can interpret the left side as the kinetic energy of a certain state or a many particle state of um, fermionic particles, namely those given by Slater determinants, where you have um, single particles orbitals psi n, and then you build a function of d times n variables, x1 to xn, by uh, building such a determinant. Um, so this is a 
very high dimensional object. That's the problem when you deal with the quantum mechanical many body problem that you have so high dimensional objects. And the good thing about the inequality is that while this is somehow the, the high dimensional object, this here, the square sum of these psi n's, this is an object that's defined on Rd. That's the one particle density matrix that's much simpler to understand. And so this inequality tells you that at least certain things you can estimate in terms of the one particle density matrix. Um, I should also say, I mean, these are just uh, certain n particle fermionic n particle states. The inequality is true for general anti-symmetric functions of, of n variables, but by some convexity argument, but the inequality as stated is good enough for us. And um, this will not be needed in what follows. Let me explain. So this is once again, the same inequality. Let me explain what the physical meaning of this inequality is or in which way physical principles are expressed in a mathematical way in this inequality. The first thing is um, the uncertainty principle. That's something that can be understood by simply taking n equal to one in the inequality. So the, then the assumption is simply that this function psi that's, that appears in the inequality is L2 normalized. In other words, psi squared is a probability density. And the uncertainty principle says or wants to exclude the case that this probability density concentrates and becomes like a Dirac function. Okay, And so what you have, if you have a bound on the left side on the L2 norm of the gradient, then you can control this. This is this probability density, but you can control it to a power greater than one. This means that you exclude concentration, right? I mean, the best thing would be if you could prove an L infinity bound, then this could really not concentrate. But somehow proving a bound with a one plus something with an exponent greater than one is the next best thing you can get. So this means the probability density cannot concentrate too much, so it needs to spread out. And that's important to, for instance, already to define the uh, Schrodinger uh, um, operator when you have a potential with a singularity, which would not make sense if you had a delta function. And this is actually a fact. So the inequality where n is equal to one, which quantifies this uncertainty principle, that's a certain kind of a Sobolev inequality. And in general, the Sobolev inequalities are sort of a quantification of this uncertainty principle. To discuss the, the other thing, namely the Pauli exclusion principle, that's something that refers to many particles with this N and in particular to uh, fermionic particles. And again, I just wanna compare with the extreme case. The extreme case would be that all functions are the same. So this, you think of all the functions sitting on top of each other, they're piling up. And when the functions pile up, then as we said, then the right, the, the right side grows faster in terms of n as the left side does. So put differently, if this does not happen, we interpret this as the functions going out of each other's way, right? They, they if, I mean, in physics, you say that the Pauli exclusion principle says that um, two fermi fermions cannot occupy the same state. Here, I mean, the, the way this is quantified here is sort of in space, they have to move away from each other. And the picture that I wanna recall is something you've probably seen in high school chemistry classes. These are the orbitals of hydrogen and you see how they become bigger and bigger, right? So there's the one S, then the two S sky, has in order to be orthogonal to the one S sky, it has to spread out. It has to, right, to the in, this is a positive function. This is a function which is both positive and negative. It's radially symmetric. So in order to achieve this orthogonality, it spreads out. And as you go down three S, four S, they become bigger and bigger and bigger. And similarly here, the P and the D waves, and you see the, the same pattern. In order to ensure also normality between these uh, states, 
uh, things have to grow. That's what I mean by the abstract functional analytic se sense of orthonormality. It becomes here something very concrete in space by using up more and more space. Related to this is an important locality property of the inequality, namely on the left you have an integral and on the right you have an integral. There's not a power of an integral involved. That's very important to applications, both to the original application to stability of matter that uh, Lieb and Thiering were originally interested in, but also when you very uh, use this inequality in applications to density functional theories, as has been done a lot. And also people have found this inequality to be useful in the context of nonlinear evolution equations, for instance, to bound the, the dimension of the attractors for the Navier-Stokes equation. And more and more recently, this idea that orthonormality creates, um, I mean, improves over the functional inequality or that orthonormality has some representation in space um, has been um, recognized as a governing principle in harmonic analysis, as I will explain in more detail later on in this talk. All right, so I hope we understand now what the inequality says. Here it is once again. And once we know its validity, the one question that, that is open, and that's a very important question, is what about the optimal value of this constant k here? And already in the 1976 paper, Lieb and Thiering made a conjecture. So obviously, I mean, as I said, the Sobolev inequality says that this inequality holds for a single function. Now for a single function, you have a certain constant. And what Lieb Thiering say is that in dimension one and two, this particular constant that works for a single function should work for all functions. You do not need to, to decrease the function, the constant further um, when you go to more and more functions in this formulation. On the other hand, in dimension three and higher, the situation is very much different. There, actually, it is assumed that the constant, as you increase the n, has to become smaller and smaller. It still remains positive, right? That's the theorem of Lieb Thiering. But the point is somehow, as you go along n, it becomes smaller. And actually what Lieb and Thiering conjecture is that it is attained in the limit of infinitely many functions. These functions, they're plane waves. Of course, these functions are not in L2 and, and um, their gradients are not in L2. So you have to put in some cutoff function and make this rigorous. This is something that in physics called the free Fermi guess. And the conjecture is that in dimension three and higher, the constant, the optimal constant is given by a collection of infinitely many such functions. And this is related to what's in physics known as the Thomas Fermi approximation. And if this conjecture of Lieb Thiering would be true, then this would really mean that the Thomas Fermi approximation is really a rigorous lower bound to quantum mechanics, which would be quite a, a, a nice, a fundamental result that, right, I mean, Thomas Fermi is some semi-classical theory and that this really bounds from below uh, quantum mechanics. And that would also have applications in density functional theories uh, where, which are based in part on such Thomas Fermi approximations. Also, I want to stress that this Lieb Thiering conjecture really says that there is a fundamental difference between fermionic particles in one and two dimensions and in three and higher dimensions. And so that, that would be of physical importance, I think. And I think it's fair to say that this is not understood at all. So none of, of the, the results give even a heuristic explanation why one could have such a different behavior as you change the dimensions. So now I would like to tell you a little bit about the results that have been obtained uh, recently towards these constants in the Lipterian inequalities. I'm presenting two results, they're rather different, but um, except that they are published all this year, the first result actually was um, a preprint was already available in 2018. Now it's finally published. And this result obtained jointly with Dirk Kundermark, uh, Michael Jex, and Van Tan Nam gives a lower bound on this Lip Turing constant. So we don't know its sharp value. We don't know what it is, but we can try to get an as good a constant as possible. 
And we always compare the constant with the constant that the Thomas Fermi approximation gives. I've written down the explicit numerical value. That's not so important. The important thing is sort of the factor of up to how many percent do we capture the conjectured value. And in three dimensions, we are at almost 78% of this conjecture. Okay, and so you, I mean, if you look at the evolution of these constants, the original work of Liptering gave 18 or 19%. Uh, about 10 years all, uh, ago, Dolbo, Laptev, and Loss got 74%. Uh, and as I said, the currently best result is at 78% of the conjectured value. Um, the fact that the inequality appears here with a, the constant appears here with the power one over D, that can be seen both as a good and a bad thing. Uh, on the one hand, well, we do get a, a unified value in all dimensions. We get similar values in all, I mean, one can do such a computation in other dimensions as well. And um, it's not only in three dimensions, this is the best possible. On the other hand, you see there also that we do not see a difference in dimensions. All the dimensions, as far as this first theorem is concerned, really um, are on the same level. The second type of results that I want to mention was obtained recently with David Gontier and uh, Mathieu Levine. And what we do there is we look at this inequality, but now we constrain ourselves to look at no more than n functions. Right? So Liptering tells us there is one constant that works for an arbitrary number of functions. But as I said before, it might be possible that for a fixed number of functions or at most n functions, you can do better. You could have a larger constant. Could be, right? I mean, the Liptering con conjecture says that in one and two dimensions, no, you need the same. I, I mean, the, the, this concept is this, always the same. But on the other hand, they say that in three dimensions and higher, actually the constants go down. And so this theorem that, so, so let me first introduce this notation, that K superscript N means the optimal constant when you restrict yourself to at most N functions. Of course, this builds a non-increasing sequence whose limit is exactly the optimal constant uh, in the Lipterian inequality. And the theorem that we uh, proved there, this was proved last year, published this year, is that if the dimension is greater or equal than three, then there is a certain sequence going to infinity along which these constants are strictly decreasing. So this is really the first time that we do see a dimensional influence here, where we do see that, um, that in three dimensions, when you take more and more functions, you need smaller and smaller constants. It does not tell us that the more and more functions you want are essentially these plane waves. We still have no idea how to solve this, but at least um, this was a new result which reflects this dimensional dependence. Now, I want to change my point of view somewhat. So far, we looked at these Liptering inequalities as an, uh, inequalities for orthonormal systems of Sobolev differentiable functions. Now, I want to look at a different family of inequalities, which at first sight seems very unrelated. But what I'm going to tell you is that for a certain value, a certain particular case of these this uh, family of inequalities, this is actually equivalent to the inequality that we've seen before, even though this might not be obvious at first sight. Okay, and so this is, these are the Liptering inequalities in spectral form. So what we have there is a Schrodinger operator minus Laplacian plus V. This is a self-adjoint lower semi-bounded operator in L2 of RD. Its negative spectrum is discrete consists of eigenvalues of finite multiplicities, and we denote all these eigenvalues counting multiplicities by ej. And then what you do is you take the absolute value of these eigenvalues, raise them to the power gamma and sum them. And the, what the, the Liptering inequality says is that this spectral quantity can be bounded by an integral of the negative part of the potential 
to a certain power that's given by scaling. The constant that's involved, L gamma D, is a universal constant that only depends on gamma and D. Okay? And what I wanted to say meant before is if you take gamma equal to one, so if you look at the sum of the negative eigenvalues, then this is equivalent to the Lipkerian inequality that we've seen before. And the equivalence really is meant in the strongest possible sense, meaning that knowing the best K on the previous slides is tells you what the best L is in this inequality for gamma equal to one and vice versa. Knowing what the best optimal orthonormal functions are there me tells you what the best V is and the best optimize the sequence of optimizing orthonormal functions tells you what the best sequence of optimizing V is. Okay, so they're really equivalent. And so analogously and more generally, what Lieb Turing asked is what is the optimal value of this constant over here? And motivated in part by what I described before, one comes up with two natural guesses. The first guess is, well, of course you can, similarly as before, truncate the sum and just say, well, how about bounding a single eigenvalue, a single eigenvalue in terms of a, a, the potential. And that gives you a certain constant L1. And so this constant, of course, cannot be smaller than the constant that you need to bound one eigenvalue. Another thing is you could make, define the so-called classical constant. What that means is you put a large constant in front of the potential, you denote the eigenvalues by, by Ej of lambda to reflect this dependence on lambda. Now this thing here can be written more suggestively as the trace of a certain function of this Schrodinger operator. And taking lambda, the coupling constant to infinity is the same as going to a semi-classical limit where Planck's constant goes to zero. So, and then we know from semi-classical analysis or micro-local analysis that instead of taking the trace of a function we can asymptotically also take the integral over phase space of the same function of the symbol of the operator. So this justifies this inequality, asymptotic inequality as lambda goes to infinity. And then once you're there, you can do the dxi integral for each fixed x and you find such a quantity. And so you see, this looks exactly like the right-hand side in the slip Turing inequality except that now you have a very specific constant. It's the constant that you got when you did that integral. And so once again, the optimal constant here cannot be better than the constant that you get in this limit. So, and the conjecture of Lieb Turing was that the maximum of these two constants actually gives you the optimal constant in the inequality. And this actually was proved in, in a couple of cases I put the references down here. However, it's one should also emphasize that in a number of cases it has been disproved. And when it was disproved, it's not that people found another conjecture. So there are some cases that are open. And the important thing to stress is, however, that still for gamma equal to one, when we look at the eigenvalues, which was dual to what I mentioned before, then one still believes that this conjecture is true and that this maximum gives you the, the optimal constant. And so now I can state a more general version of this theorem obtained with Gontier and Levin. And this says that the truncated Lieb Turing constants, what does that mean? Again, we just look at eigenvalues up to a fixed number n and we ask for the best constant for, in, for this restricted inequality. The, these restricted truncated Lip Turing inequalities are strictly increasing along a subsequence when gamma is large enough. Okay, and when gamma is equal to one, this gives exactly this condition d greater or equal than three that we were talking about before. Okay, so once again, you see this effect that while Lip Turing 
tells you, I mean, one constant is good enough for all n. When we truncate this, we see that sometimes these constants really do increase in contrast to some of these conjectures, right, that said that, that the one constant working for, for one eigenvalue is good enough. And in particular, what we also prove in this paper is that in particular, this, the, the n, n1 somehow can be chosen to be one. So you have the strict inequality between L2 and L1. And so this increases together with previous results significantly the range of where the Lipterian conjecture is known to fail. As I said again, it is believed to hold, however, in some other cases. And also what we prove here can be actually seen in some sense as a support of that the conjecture does hold. Now, two sentences about the proof of this theorem. I was mentioning, I was emphasizing at the beginning of this talk that the Lipterian inequality has this locality property, right? Which is very important in quantum mechanics, which in general is non-local. But to the extent of the validity, validity of the inequality, we have a locality. So if you have two potential, if the potential consists of two widely separated bumps, then the eigenvalues are roughly the same I mean, sorry, the eigenvalues of the combined potential are roughly the eigenvalues of one plus the eigenvalues of the other one, which is reflected that just the left side of the inequality is additive over these two different pieces and the right side is additive over these two pieces. And the idea of the proof of this theorem is that one looks at this more precisely. And what we've been able to do is we, we have been able to find an exponentially small attraction between very far apart pieces of the same potential. So in order to prove this inequality, for instance, we take the optimal potential for L1, we place a second copy very, very far away from the first, and we look exactly how the eigenvalues change um, when you do this, and when you move them further and further away. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but I, I, I don't want to go into this at this point. There's another thing I want to briefly mention. I mean, this theorem um, raises another question. So once you have this sequence of NJs along which the constant increases, you might look at optimal potentials. We actually can prove that there is always an optimal potential Vn. And so you have this sequence of potentials and you wonder what do, does this sequence do as you increase N? How does it behave? And one thing that we are suggesting, and this adds a new scenario to these two scenarios that Lee Turing had uh, proposed, is that this actually grows not um, downwards, but sideways. In other ways, it could, it's possible, it's conceivable that these different potentials grow sideways and establish something like a periodic structure. We do have analytic results in that direction, and we even have numerics in two dimensions that gives evidence to this new scenario. But once again, um, I don't want to uh, become too technical at this point, and rather I want to uh, jump to the next and last part of this talk, which concerns this idea of inequalities for orthonormal functions. Okay, so it's uh, a new part. Let's summarize what we've seen so far. We had a well-known inequality in classical analysis, namely Sobolev's inequality, and we have seen that this inequality is a version for orthonormal functions, and compared to the um, and this version for orthonormal functions has a good property on how it depends on the number functions. So good, what does good mean here? It's, I mean, that it improves over the, a simple use of the triangle inequalities. Remember at the very beginning, I told you that if you look at the functions, just take the same function over and over again, then you have a constant that goes like n to the minus two over d. The same thing is you, the functions don't have to be the same. So for general fun n functions, L2 normalized, but not necessarily orthonormal. The inequality holds with n to the minus two over d. What Lipterian say is that if you have orthonormality, that you can drop this factor n to the minus two over d. 
So the question that this raises is, is this actually a general principle that's behind this? Is this something that works for different inequalities as well? And yes, if such a principle exists, is this good for anything? I mean, Lip Tiering proved the inequality in order to do something, not just because they wanted to study inequalities. So can we get something uh, from such hypothetical inequalities? To put this in a, in a slightly more uh, technical setting, let us assume that we're given a Hilbert space H and a measure space X, and then a bounded linear operator T, which maps the Hilbert space to LQ of X for some Q greater than one. And so the fact that this operator is bounded simply means that we have an inequality that T of Psi in LQ is bounded by the norm of Psi in the Hilbert space. And the question that we're asking now is, is there some number sigma depending of course on the operator T, such that if you have a bunch of orthonormal functions, then the square sum of T Psi N in Q over two, right? You put Q over two because you already have a square. So for a single function, this is exactly what you have on the left side over here. You ask if there's such an integral is bounded by n to the sigma, where importantly, sigma is now strictly smaller than q over two. The inequality with q over two follows simply by the triangle inequality. That's the inequality you get when you take the same function over and over. And that works for general functions without orthonormality. The question is, can you beat the triangle inequality? And uh, to tell you the answer, I mean, we don't know, right? So we have, found in recent years some examples of operators for which this is true, for which one can prove such an inequality with an improved value of sigma there. But if you give me some operator, I cannot tell you whether it works for this or not and what the sigma is. It sort of works on a case-by-case -case study. And actually this question goes back um, uh, a long ways. Leap in 1983 proved um, version of the hardy littlewood sobolev inequality or fractional integration inequality or weak young inequality for systems of orthonormal functions. Namely, what he proved is the operator that's underlying here is convolution with um, a singular kernel. You convolve these psi ends with this, raise it to the power that's dictated by scaling, and then you can bound this uh, integral by n. And of course, if you compare it with the power Q over two, Q over two would be the power there. So then you gain. So this is an inequality in the spirit of the ones that I'm asking for. And in fact, uh, this, um, this inequality, this HLS inequality for orthonormal functions, that's equivalent to a bound on the number of negative eigenvalues of certain generalized Schrodinger operators, where you bound the number of negative eigenvalues in terms of an integral of the potential. All right, now here are two theorems which are examples of such inequalities. I've picked uh, somewhat older inequalities. We've proved some other ones, but these are perhaps the clearest. They were obtained together with uh, Levin, Lieb, and Seiringer, and uh, Sabin. And so the first one concerns the Stichertz inequality, and the second one, the Stein-Thomas inequality. Those are inequalities that are well known in um, harmonic analysis, and which also have uh, been useful in, in a number of applications. Let me talk a little bit more about the Stichertz inequality first. The Stichertz inequality concerns uh, mathematical quantification of the dispersive nature of the Schrodinger equation. So, and it's the, the sh free Schrodinger equation with just the Laplacian. So, I mean, this operator is a self adjoint in L2, so we know that it generates a unitary time evolution. So the L2 norm along this Schrodinger flow does not change. However, this conservation of the L2 norm ignores part of this fact that, that is well known to me that wave packets actually spread out. Right? And 
become smaller and, and more and more spread out as time goes by. And so the Strichatz inequality is a way to quantify this phenomenon. If you just see, I mean, you, you do some integrations in X and some integrations in T and some powers in between. The important thing is just that an integral over T is finite. Okay, and that if an integral is finite, means that this quantity in some sense goes to zero at infinity. That's this, this dispersive effect. And the powers here are again dominated, uh, um, explained through scaling. And what the inequality says is that in a certain range of Q, um, one does have such an inequality for orthonormal functions with, uh, in terms of power of N and the power that you get up here is actually such that it beats the triangle inequality. And the range of exponents that we have there, that's optimal. And similarly, the stein thomas inequality, what you do there is you're given now functions that live on the sphere, square integral on the sphere, you compute the Fourier transform, meaning you think of these psi n's as measures on the sphere, compute the Fourier transform as such measures, and then look at this Fourier um, integral as a function defined on all of Rd. And what you can do is, again, look at the square sum, raise it to the one particular power that there is, integrate and bound this in terms of the number of functions. Once again, we have an inequality for orthonormal functions with a dependence on the number of functions that improves over the triangle inequality, and that is best possible. Okay, now these both inequalities here are actually a reflection of the same phenomenon in uh, harmonic analysis, namely that of Fourier restriction to, to hypersurfaces with positive curvature. Um, there are some common features between the proof of these two theorems and these other theorems that we have proved, but which I did not state, but there is really not a general method that, that provides these um, proofs. I should also say, in some sense, proving these inequalities is often not as hard or perhaps equally hard as proving really the optimality of these this growth in N, because that means really you have to find a scenario of functions, find them and arrange them in a certain way such that uh, they, they saturate uh, or give these bounds. So that's um, proving that this optimality in both cases is actually um, quite uh, mathematically quite, quite a challenge. Um, both, I was asking, I mean, we do have the inequalities, but we also do have the application. And so, for instance, the Strichatz inequality for orthonormal functions that was used at um, zero and positive density dynamics for uh, fermions by Levine and Sabin. And this inequality down here was proved to get bounds on the number of eigenvalues for Schrodinger operators with complex potentials. Right? So far, we had Schrodinger operators with real potentials. There, the eigenvalues are just negative numbers. They can only accumulate at the origin. When you have complex potentials, eigenvalues could uh, approach anywhere the positive real axis. And it's exactly at such points that such quantities, this is the restriction to the energy shell at that energy, the possible accumulation points where such inequalities come into play. Um, let's see. So I let me make two, two more remarks at the end. I said before that this range of exponents was optimal. Well, it is to some extent, but you could, it's optimal when you have this exponent. However, there might be a regime where you could, a, a larger regime where you could prove a similar bound, but with, with a worse growth. And there are some open questions. There has been some um, progress. This is, I mean, and this is a point where really modern techniques in harmonic analysis, Kakeya constructions come in. And that's uh, an interesting open problem. And one open problem that I, that is also completely open is that uh, concerning optimal constants in these inequalities. Remember, I mean, there's a Strichatz inequality, there's a Strichatz inequality for a single function, there's a 
uh, Stein Thomas inequality for a single function. We have single functions. We have these scenarios of functions that saturate this when you have more and more functions in both settings. And so the analog of the Lipirin conjecture would be that it's one of these two uh, concepts that gives the optimal constants. I don't know that I don't have any support to, to prove this. I'm just saying this has not been studied, neither has been studied what happens with these truncated constants where we saw this strict monotonicity in these recent works. So anyway, there are lots of things to be done, lots of things to be understood, both on the concrete level of the inequalities and on just understanding this general picture of orthonormal uh, inequalities for orthonormal functions. And that brings me to the conclusion of this uh, talk. Um, we've seen Lipirian inequalities, which are mathematical quantification of uh, two principles in quantum physics, namely the uncertainty and the inclusion, exclusion principles. And I've try to explain you that this inequality has many applications in mass physics, in analysis, and PDE. I've told you a little bit about the quest for optimal constants and the structure of optimal configurations. This is uh, far from over. And then I've uh, told you about a new direction of research, namely generalizing these inequalities to other inequalities, finding versions of orthonormal functions for these inequalities, like for the Stechertz inequality, the stein thomas inequalities, and in particular, finding the optimal dependence on the functions. Well, that's all I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much for your attention. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Rupert, for this uh, very nice lecture. Uh, I don't see any applause button, otherwise I would press it. So uh, we have... Uh, Time for questions. Uh, if you would like to uh, raise your hand, then uh, I can unmute you if you want to ask any question. Maybe I'll ask one why people still think about it. Um, so in your uh, statement about the Lipirian conjecture, right, and this sort of strict increase of the optimal constants with n, uh, so um, you explained that there was no good heuristic, so to say, explaining, so to say, what, why n should want to go to infinity or not. But I guess you have a proof that sort of shows, right? So n wants to go to infinity. Does the proof also sort of clearly um, uh, show sort of what goes wrong in the opposite regime? And do you expect this to be sharp? I mean, is there a simple explanation, so to say, where, where does this uh, condition on gamma with the, I think, one minus d over two or something where this comes from? Right, exactly. So it was, uh, you're referring to this theorem here, right? Exactly where this comes yeah, from. Two minus so, two. Uh, I guess the, I mean, it's a natural question we thought. Um, a lot about it. I don't think we have a, com a complete um, explanation. So some other thing is, so you, you look at a double well potential, somewhere where the two wells are very far apart. And it's not uh, exactly a sum of the two single well potentials, but you have to do something a little bit more complicated. But anyway, so the eigenvalues are the eigenvalues in here and the eigenvalues in there. And the then you look at the interaction matrix, which somehow if you look at two eigenvalues and this is a two by two matrix, which describe the hopping between these two different wells. And in some sense, where this condition comes from is on a bad control on the off diagonal term. It's not the term that's relevant. I mean, so to speak, the, the really the, the, the diagonal term, which is what is relevant and which gives the attraction, that's always um, has the right sign. I mean, it's, it's always attractive, even beyond that range. But it's the fact that we cannot better control the off diagonal term when you jump from one well to the next. And we've tried to do better. Um, even, I mean, everything depends on the exponential decay of wave functions, and we try to use that better. Um, I don't see how to improve our proof at that stage, but we're not sure. I should perhaps also mention one thing which I did not say, um, namely that this phenomenon that we prove there is actually very, very hard to capture numerically. 
So even though we, I mean, there has been numeric done, which completely missed this phenomenon. And even after we knew the phenomenon of this exponential, uh, exponentially small attraction, it took us quite some time until we could really actually see it numerically. Okay, so um, I'm saying this because we, I mean, you might ask just run numerics and see whether there's an attraction, whether we actually mi are miss, whether this off diagonal term that we cannot control actually can be better controlled or not. And we, it's very, very hard to see actually whether this is the case or whether it's not the case. 